Today, we're talking about something you see all the time, common hand fractures. But we're gonna go beyond the textbook. This is all about the practical stuff, how to sharpen your decision-making in the clinic, in the ER, and get ready for your boards. All right, here's the plan. We'll kick things off with the big picture guiding principles. Then we'll dive into metacarpal fractures and those key numbers you gotta know. After that, thumb fractures, specifically the tricky intraarticular ones. We'll move on to the phalanges and PIP joints and wrap up with a really important one, the thumb UCL injury, you know, the stainer lesion. Okay, first things first, let's talk about the guiding principles. What is our actual goal here? What's the why behind everything we do for hand fractures? And here it is, the single most important rule. The main goal is to get a full range of finger motion back after you're done. Seriously, tattoo this on your brain. Everything we do, I mean every single decision, from the OR to the clinic, is all about this one thing. Because what good is a perfectly healed bone in a finger that can't move? It's useless, right? So motion is king. So that begs the question, how do we actually do that? How do we make the right call to preserve that motion? Well, it turns out our entire decision tree really boils down to answering two simple fundamental questions about the fracture itself. And this is that decision tree. It's so beautifully simple and it works for pretty much any fracture you'll see. Question one, can you actually reduce it? If the answer is no, well, that's an easy one. The patient's going to the OR. Now, if you can reduce it, you ask question two, is it stable? Can you maintain that reduction? If it's just gonna fall apart, well, that's an unstable fracture and it needs some kind of fixation. See, reducible and stable, you're good. Irreducible or unstable, you've got work to do. All right, let's put this framework into practice. We're moving on to metacarpal fractures. And for these, you've gotta know your numbers. It's absolutely key. So let's talk about the classic boxer's fracture of the fifth metacarpal neck. This is bread and butter stuff for the ER and a favorite for board exams. The big question is always, how much angulation can we actually accept? And here's the kicker. The answer is totally different depending on which finger is involved. And here are those numbers. You can see a really clear pattern, right? For the index and middle fingers, you have very little wiggle room. We're talking 10 to 15 degrees max. But as you move over to the ring finger, you can accept a bit more, maybe 20 to 30. And for the small finger, you can get away with a surprising amount, up to 30 or even 40 degrees. This is super high yield for exams. You need to know these numbers. But let's talk about why this is the case. And here's the why. It's a fantastic clinical pearl rooted in anatomy. It all comes down to the CMC joints, the carpometacarpal joints. The fourth and fifth CMC joints have a good amount of motion. They're mobile, so they can actually compensate for some angulation in the metacarpal neck. But the second and third CMC joints, they're basically rigid, fixed. There's no compensation, so any little bit of angulation is going to cause a functional problem, like a palpable metacarpal head in the palm. Okay, so let's say your fracture is unstable and needs fixation. You're standing there thinking, K-wires or plates? There's no one-size-fits-all answer here. It's all about weighing the pros and cons. K-wires are great because they're less invasive, you're preserving more of that soft tissue envelope, but you have the risk of pin tract infections. On the flip side, plates or screws give you super rigid fixation, which is awesome for starting early motion. The downside? It's a bigger dissection and you always worry about the hardware causing tendon irritation or adhesions down the line. All right, let's switch gears and talk about the thumb. Specifically, we're going to tackle a really important intraarticular fracture, the Bennett fracture. So what is a Bennett fracture? It's an intraarticular fracture at the base of the thumb metacarpal. But the key thing, the absolute most important part to understand is the deforming force. You've got the APL tendon, the abductor pollicis longus, and it's constantly pulling that large metacarpal fragment dorsally, radially, and proximally. It's this unopposed pole that you have to fight against during your reduction. So how do you reduce it? This is the classic go-to technique you need to know. First, you pull traction along the length of the thumb. That helps disimpact the fracture. Next, you adduct the metacarpal base, and then, this is the key, you pronate the thumb metacarpal. That's the move that directly counters the pull of the APL. Once you're holding that reduction, you get your K-wires in under fluoro to lock it in place. And here's another magic number for you. Two millimeters. If you've done your closed reduction and you look at your x-ray and there's still an articular step off of more than two millimeters, that's your indication to open it up. You cannot leave that kind of incongruity in the joint. You have to go in and get it perfect to prevent post-traumatic arthritis. 
Okay, moving further down the finger to the phalanges and the PIP joints, with these injuries, the enemy has a name, and that name is stiffness. It's a constant battle. And this really highlights a huge shift in how we think about these injuries. The old way was fix the bone, immobilize it, wait for it to heal. But we're learning, just like with flexor tendon repairs, that early protected movement is hugely beneficial. So your fixation isn't the end of the story. It's actually the beginning. You're creating a stable construct so that the hand therapist can get that finger moving safely and prevent it from getting hopelessly stiff. Now, this is a tough one, the dorsal PIP fracture dislocation. The decision-making here really hangs on one thing, the size of that volar articular fragment. If it's less than 40% of the joint surface, the joint is usually stable, and you can manage it with a dorsal block splint. But if that fragment is big, more than 40%, that joint is unstable. And honestly, there's no single best answer. You'll see people do ORIF, extension block pinning, even volar plate arthroplasty. It's a real surgical challenge. All right, last topic. We're going to talk about a really important soft tissue injury, one that can sometimes trick you because it can come with a small fracture. We're talking about a thumb UCL tear, and specifically, the dreaded Stinner lesion. So what exactly is a Stinner lesion? It's the whole reason why complete UCL tears need surgery. Picture this, the UCL tears, and the proximal end of it actually gets displaced and flips up, so it's sitting on top of the adductor epineurosis. Now there's this big sheet of tissue between the two ends of the torn ligament. There is no way it can heal on its own. It's physically impossible. That's why you have to go in and fix it. So how do you pick this up in the clinic? On your physical exam, you're going to stress the joint. And you're looking for significant laxity, right? More than 35 degrees or at least 15 degrees more than the other uninjured thumb. But here's the real tell. It's the end point. When you stress a normal ligament, you feel a nice firm stop. With a complete tear, a Steiner lesion, there's no firm end point. It just feels soft, kind of mushy. That feeling right there is your biggest clue that you're dealing with a complete rupture that needs surgery. So if we take a step back and look at everything we've talked about, there's one unifying idea, isn't there? It's all about this delicate balance. You need to get enough stability to hold the reduction, but you want to do it with the least amount of dissection possible. All so you can start that early protected movement to get the best final outcome. And really, that's the question you should be asking yourself every single time you see a patient with a hand fracture. What is the absolute minimum stability I need to allow for the maximum safe early motion? If you can answer that question for every patient, for every fracture, then you're on your way to truly mastering these injuries.